So today we're going in search of a plant that most people will only have seen in cultivation, the common hops. It's an awesome plant that many of us have probably enjoyed in a fermented beverage or two. Now, as with any of my botanical inquiries, I tend to get kind of caught up in the taxonomic relationships, which teaches us some interesting things about the evolutionary tree of life, and hops has some really cool relatives. So come on, let's go see if we can find it. Meet the common hop. Now, this isn't the plant that we use to brew beer. We use its European cousin, but nonetheless, it's a very similar species. It's a perennial vining plant, as you can see here. It's scrambling all over this roadside, and that's kind of where it likes to grow. Vines tend to be edge species because that's where they can grow on plants but still get enough sun. Now, the leaves on this species are highly variable. You can see they go from unlobed to three lobed and sometimes up to five lobes, but it's pretty easy to recognize, especially if it's a female plant. Hops is dioecious, meaning males and females are separate individuals. And this one right here is a female. And you can tell that because she has these reproductive structures. These are the hops themselves. This is what you'd use to make beer. And if you get in there, it does kind of have an IPA smell to it. Now this is a cone-like structure that we call a stroboli. And inside each one of these little sort of sacs here is the seed itself. Now one of my favorite parts about this species is where it sits taxonomically. It's a member of the family Cannabaceae. And if that sounds like something familiar, you'll recognize it as marijuana. But that's not the only recognizable species that this is related to. And in fact, there is another one that I can see just on the other side of us here that is nothing like this vine. So come on, let's go see that one. And here's what we've been looking for. And no, it's not this vine. It's actually the tree itself. This is the common hackberry. And it's easily distinguishable by these corky-like protrusions on its bark. This is one you gotta get up and close and personal with because looking at this from this angle, it looks like a mini topographic map of the Western United States. It's so cool. What's more, it is ecologically valuable. The tree itself gets large, produces a nice overstory, and the leaves feed lots of different insects. In fact, four species of insect are known to feed solely on the leaves of hackberry alone. Awesome. Another easily distinguishing feature of this tree are its leaves. If you pull one up, take a look at it. They're rough on both sides, the base of the leaf is uneven, and along the edges are these large tooth-like serrations. Also, these trees produce copious amounts of fruits that feed migratory songbirds. It's invaluable, especially this time of year when birds are moving through, trying to head south for the winter. I love this tree and I recommend it for any native landscape. Now for a long time, Cannabaceae was lumped in with this family, Urticaceae, and this is one of my favorite representatives. This is Canada Clearweed, Pilea pumila, and I like it because it doesn't sting. Now genetic evidence has suggested that they're separate, but they're still closely allied on the tree of life. Pilea pumila in and of itself is an interesting species because it likes these shaded, moist environments, and it's been shown that it actually is adapting to the toxic effects of garlic mustard. Plants that have grown around garlic mustard for their entire lives actually do worse when you plant them away from garlic mustard. So it's proof that evolution is happening even on our timescales. I love this plant and I'm really happy to see it doing so well here. Now here's a nettle I don't want to mess with too much. This is wood nettle, Laportia canadensis, and like many members of this family, it packs a punch. And it does throw because of these tiny stinging hairs that are located all over the leaves and all over the stems. Now these hairs are marvels of evolution. They act a lot like hypodermic needles. At the base is a sac that's filled with a chemical cocktail that one of the ingredients includes formic acid. And it, the whole hair itself is a very, very thin, very delicate silicate type contraption. Now when something comes along and brushes against that, it breaks the tip off of that hair and makes a very sharp puncture wound. And it's hollow on the inside so that when you brush up against it and it pushes down on that little sac, it pumps liquid into you just like a hypodermic needle, which is why it stings so much. Now this has been shown to be an excellent deterrent for large mammalian herbivores, things like deer and rabbits, but it's not that good 
at deterring insects. In fact, if you look at these plants here, there's full of insect damage. And in fact, nettles themselves are important species for insects. Many different species of butterflies and moths and various other types of insects feed on nettles. They're very important plants, even if they give you a bit of a sting. I like them, but only from a distance. <laughs>